Welcome. We'd like to start by thanking the CFA Institute as well as our panel of judges. What a true honor to be presenting at this stage in the competition. However, in the presence of time, let's get started. We're initiating a hold recommendation and $100 price target for Kansas City Southern. A hold recommendation requires a delicate balance of positives and negatives. We'll outline three for of each. As for the positives, a recent credit rating upgrade has allowed management to decrease the cost of debt while increasing maturities. Next, we believe Kansas City Southern is in a unique position to exponentially grow revenues in the years ahead. Most of that revenue growth will take place in Mexico, where management has ramped up revenue exposure to 46% in 2013. As for the negatives, we believe management has been a bit overzealous in the timing of their expected revenue growth. And to be quite honest, we found most of that revenue growth is already priced into the valuation. And finally, we foresee several headwinds that lie ahead for Kansas City Southern, which we'll discuss later in the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Jacob to provide an analysis of the industry. Jacob. Thanks, Jared. From food, gas, and, and cars, railroads transport commodities we use every day. And they're a linchpin undergirding an efficient economy. We've seen three key drivers of demand. One, international trade. Two, economic and industrial production. And three, the price of oil. You can take a gallon of fuel, and a train can move a literal ton of freight four times farther than a truck. We've also identified two industry trends. The first is an increased demand to transport oil. This is due to U.S. oil production skyrocketing since 2011, and this bodes well for railroads. The second trend is a decreased demand to transport coal. This is due to U.S. power plants slowly transitioning to using more natural gas instead of coal instead of coal as their source of fuel, and railroads have felt this lack of business. Finally, the industry is fairly concentrated with the seven largest firms generating 90% of revenues in the U.S. The smallest out of those seven firms in the U.S. is yours truly, Kansas City Southern, which captures 3% of that market share. With that, I'll turn it to my colleague Derek, who will discuss the company more in depth. Derek? Thanks a lot, Jacob. Founded in 1887, Kansas City Southern was the first rail company to build track north to south as opposed to the more traditional at the time, east to west. With operations in the U.S., Mexico, and Panama, they also hold two key concessions from the Mexican government, the first of which grants them sole access to providing rail transport between the U.S. and Mexico, and also they have the concession to serve uh, the port of Lazaro Cardenas on the west coast of Mexico. They primarily generate revenue from six different divisions. Now, they need Mexico to do well, and we believe they will. Over the last eight years, the average manufacturing wage rate in China has been steadily increasing, so much to the point, in fact, that it's now directly in line with the average manufacturing wage rate in Mexico. We believe this will provide a great incentive for, uh, for co uh, companies to relocate their plants or facilities in Mexico to take advantage of this cost structure. And secondly is the recent energy reform we believe will be a revelation to the industry. It now allows for foreign direct investment through joint ventures with the Mexican government, abolishing the previously state-run enterprise. We do think it will be one to two years before Kansas City Southern's energy sees significant increases. However, they will benefit from transporting the industrial goods needed to actually build up that infrastructure. To illustrate this, on the right-hand side of this picture is Texas, with each silver speck representing a specific drill site. The left-hand side is Mexico currently. There's nothing there. As this foreign direct investment starts to flow into Mexico, we believe these drill sites will begin popping up everywhere, leaving them to benefit tremendously. Now you may be saying, Derek, Kansas City Southern doesn't transport natural gas. They don't, but they do transport frac sand, which is a key component needed for these drill sites. As you can see, as U.S. tonnage production has increased over the last couple of years, so have Kansas City Southern's frac sand revenues. We believe this scenario will play out similarly, if not on an even greater scale in Mexico. As you can see, Kansas City Southern's rail track falls directly in line with many of the largest oil refineries in the United States. With the increase in demand for oil, Kansas City Southern is positioned strategically excellent to take advantage of this opportunity. However, a caveat, with the expected opening of the Keystone XL pipeline in the next couple of years, the demand needed to ship crude by rail will decrease as they want to go with the cheaper alternative of shipping crude by pipeline. Also, with the recent uh, safety concerns of shipping crude by rail and the train, um, the train derailments that have occurred, there is a potential for increased regulation, which could also um, impact them in, in their energy uh, benefits. Next, looking at intermodal. Currently, Kansas City Southern holds less than a 3% market share, so there's room for expansive growth. 
but more importantly, at the Port of Lazaro Cardenas, where they hold the key concession, there's a $900 million investment in the new AP Merck's terminal. This will significantly increase capacity at the port, which Kansas City Southern will benefit tremendously. However, another caveat, there's been recent drug cartel problems in the city of Lazaro. It's gotten so severe, in fact, that the Mexican government has gone down and is running the entire city in the interim. So we are very skeptical and leery of management's optimistic projections because we believe there will be inefficiencies stemming from that. And finally, their automobile division. These four automobile manufacturers have recently, or plan in the near term, opening up new plants. Now, we have found that out of these automobiles, after talking to the former CEO of Kansas City Southern, he informed us many of the automobiles coming up from Mexico actually stop at the border and get transferred onto Union Pacific, a competitor of KSU. Also, we learned that out of these four automobile manufacturers, only one is even in the top five most demanded vehicles in the United States, and it's Honda, sliding in all the way at the bottom fifth position. And finally, we spoke to the National Automobile Dealership Association, whose research indicates that American consumers actually prefer American brand automobiles nowadays, as well as American manufactured automobiles, as opposed to these foreign constituents. So although we, uh, we do see that the supply and the capacity will increase, we are very skeptical of the optimistic projections that have been laid out that will stem from this division. I'd now like to pass it back to Jared, who's going to talk about our financial analysis. Jared? Thanks, Derek. We concluded there were two key financial aspects that impacted our valuation. First, being capital spending. In 2013, Kansas City Southern's CapEx totaled 25% of revenue. This continued level of capital spending will put pressure on management to continue to grow earnings in order to maintain their current valuation. Next is operating ratio, which has improved on average 130 basis points annually since 2010. Now, while increased volumes and a disciplined cost structure will be the primary catalyst of continued operating ratio improvement, we've identified two key technological advancements that will also aid in improving efficiency. First, we spoke to the manufacturer of Multirail, a high-precision measurement device designed to calculate the weight of the rail car as well as monitor its center of gravity. This technology improves efficiency by its ability to perform while the locomotives remain moving at up to 14 kilometers per hour. Next is the expanded use of the Automax rail car by increasing auto per rail capacity to 20 units from 12. I'm going to turn it back to Derek, who's going to begin our valuation discussion. Thanks a lot, Jared. In our discounted cash flow, the first thing we did was model for an operating lease adjustment. This was done by progressively achieving a 50-50 split between capital and operating leases by 2017 based on management's guidance of wanting to move that direction. We then looked at some of the key revenue drivers, which I've mentioned throughout the presentation. Then we looked at some of the cost savings approach and the improvement in the operating ratio that Jared just touched on. We then calculated a multi-stage DCF, first looking at a four-year free cash flow forecast. We then moved into a stage two growth rate, progressively decreasing from 8% down to 3% over the next 10-year period, culminating with a terminal value and a terminal growth rate of 2.5%, tabulating a DCF target price of $94.24. Jared? Thanks. We also in included two market multiple valuation methods, price to earnings and EV to EBITDA. After management recently reduced guidance for 2014, we determined Kansas City Southern was no longer worthy of their lofty historical premiums. Therefore, we applied a 20% premium to both price to earnings and EB to EBITDA based primarily on our belief that Kansas City Southern will continue to grow slightly faster than the industry average. Next, we conducted sensitivity on our market multiple valuations. By applying a plus and minus two times multiple, we've derived a bear and bull market scenario. This gave us confidence in our final price target of $100 per share by equal weighting our three valuation techniques. However, these weren't the only mar valuation methods we conducted. The most notable others were a linear trend and autoregressive one period model, which both produced statistically significant results at a 95% confidence interval. Now, while the increased revenue forecast decreases the relevance of these regression-based models, we believe the longer the delay in revenue growth, the more visibility these methods will receive. I'm now gonna turn it over back to I'm now going to turn it over to Jacob to talk about the risks. Thanks, Jared. The most severe risks with this company is a demand shift away from coal, currency, exchange rate risk, and a loss of their Mexican concession. Earlier this year, Mexico's Congress passed a bill which would open up access to their railways. This could potentially revoke KSU's exclusive rights to those railways. If this bill is passed later this year by Mexico's Senate, it would increase competition and suppress KSU's pricing power in Mexico. Some additional risks include litigation, lower oil prices, and an expansion of the Panama Canal. Furthermore, as we enter the latter stage of the business cycle expansion, KSU could incur substantial losses over the next contraction due to it being cyclical in nature. It's not the best defensive stock. Although the company does have a very compelling growth story, the risks and headwinds act as a counterbalance to that growth, confirming our hold. Derek, you want to hit up the Monte Carlo? 
I love to, Jacob. We conducted a Monte Carlo simulation to test what the sensitivity of the stock price would be by fluctuating key variables. What we found supported our investment recommendation with 72% of the iterations actually falling in that realm, only 12% in the buy and 16% in the sell. In conclusion, even with their excellent financial strength, extreme growth potential, stemming largely from the Mexico story, we do believe it is counterbalanced by the delay in the revenue, the fact that much of the growth has already been priced into the market, as well as some of the risks and drags we mentioned. 